Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Facebook Live today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, no matter where you're from, thank you for tuning in and let us know in the comment section where you're tuning in from today. We love to see where everyone is joining us from. I see Fiona from Melbourne, Melbourne, Australia. We have Linda from Kentucky, Nancy from Sweden. Uh, let's see, we have Alvina from Peterborough, Ontario, um, Celeste from Austin, Texas. So thank you to all of you for joining in. Uh, if you haven't yet, please just leave us a note in the comments and let us know where you're joining us from today, uh, what the weather's like over there. Uh, we love seeing all of you from various countries around the world. It's just uh, amazing how genealogy can bring us together. So um, thank you all for joining. We're so glad to be bringing you this Facebook Live today, another fantastic session in our lineup. So we're really looking forward to it. We have with us Melissa Barker, and she'll be talking about Loose Records, a treasure trove for genealogists. So a really um, great session for you all. And before we get to it, uh, I'll just let you know about a draw that we have today. We'll be giving away a MyHeritage Complete Plan to one lucky winner in our audience. So um, in order to win today, we're going to ask uh, uh, for you all to write in the comment section and let us know about your um, most prized family heirloom. So we're speaking with the archive lady, uh, your most prized uh, family heirloom or record or document or, um, you know, whether it be an artifact or a, uh, a baby dress from your great grandmother, uh, whatever it is, let us know in the comment section. We want to hear and, and also what makes it so special? Why is it so sentimental and uh, so important to you and your family? So let us know in the comments section and we'll be giving away one MyHeritage complete plan. That's the best plan we have to offer at MyHeritage. Uh, it includes unlimited access to over 15 billion historical records, uh, access to all of MyHeritage photo tools, uh, which we talk so much about. That's the MyHeritage photo enhancer, MyHeritage in color, um, my hair, so many, so many fantastic photo tools that we have to offer, uh, unlimited family tree size, and so much more. That's a My Heritage Complete Plan that we'll be giving away at the end of today's session to one lucky winner. So uh, leave us a comment. Let us know about your most prized uh, family heirloom or record or artifact, and why is it so important uh, to you and your family? We'd like to hear that in the comments. Section. And we're looking forward to reading what you all uh, have to write for us. Um, in addition, feel free, please feel free to, to leave comments and questions throughout today's session. We love uh, taking the time to, uh, you know, to answer questions at the end of the session. Uh, so leave us a question if you have or a comment uh, for our speaker, and we hope to be able to get to it. Uh, and just to let you all know, I know, I know some people writing that they have um, conflicts or, or they're not able to join today. So don't worry about that. You can always write, you can always watch today's session uh, after it, they're, they're all recorded and they are all available for you to watch on the MyHeritage Facebook page under the videos section. So if you missed today's session or if you'd like to rewatch it, they are all available there. And uh, in your own spare time, whenever you'd like, you can go back to the MyHeritage Facebook page under the video section and watch this Facebook Live as well as all of the others. Um, so please do. So I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. We have with us Melissa Barker. She's a certified archives manager and public historian. She currently works at the Houston County Tennessee Archives. She's affectionately known as the archive lady to the genealogy community. She lectures, teaches, and writes about the genealogy research process, researching in archives and records preservation. She conducts virtual presentations across the US and other countries for historical and genealogical groups. And we are just so lucky to have her with us today. Um, so let me bring her onto the screen and she can say hello to all of us. Let's see if we can get her on here. Hello, Melissa. Hello, Esther. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. How are you today? 
I'm doing great. As you can see, I'm coming to you from our Houston County archives here in Middle Tennessee. Um, a lot of what I'm going to show you today can be found right here in this archives, and it can be found in a lot of other archives out there. Amazing. We can't wait to get started. Okay, let me share my screen. Great. And let me get this up. And we're going to go to reading view. How does that look to you, Esther? Here, let me just put it in the screen. Um, there we go. All set. Okay, thank you, Esther. And thanks for everyone for coming today. Um, if anyone who knows me and has ever heard any of my presentations, you know that I'm extremely passionate about archives. Um, I've been an archivist for 10 years. I've been a genealogist for almost 32 years. Uh, but archives is actually my passion. Uh, and one of the passions is that I have about it is I want to kind of tear the curtain down and expose all the wonderful records that can be found in archives across the world. Um, and so that's why I encourage genealogists to get online, get on those websites, look for the records, and then if possible, travel to those places, look at the records in person. If you can't travel or if it's because of COVID you can't go, you know, you can email these archives, you can talk to them about their records, you can communicate with them. Archivists want to help and there's many avenues of doing that. So don't keep, don't think that because distance is keeping you from doing your research or looking for these records, uh, reach out. Um, they're there to help. So today we're going to talk about loose records. Um, many of you may not have ever heard of this phrase or this term. Um, I use this term to talk about all of those records that are not in the bound volumes. Um, I have found a tremendous amount of records and information for my own family in loose records. But working as an archivist, the loose, loose records I get to process on a daily basis. I find some of the most wonderful records. Uh, and so you're going to see a lot of those records in my presentation. So let's get started. Um, if you've watched any of my presentations with my heritage, uh, you'll notice that I talk a lot about archives. It's because I want genealogists to understand that there is really an archive out there for everything. For um, I would like to say, and they are everywhere. They, um, there's a place where there's historical or geological records that are collected, stored, and preserved. That is an archive. It could be a business archive. It could be a church archive. Anywhere where records are stored, collected, and preserved is considered an archive. Well, you may find that there's archives out there that do not have the word archive on the building or they don't have the word archive in the name of whatever they are. This photograph is actually from here in Tennessee. This is the Polk County, Tennessee Historical Association. Uh, if you were to pass this building traveling down the road, you would look at it and think it was just a house. Um, it's actually an archive. And so that's what I'm hoping genealogists will do. Start asking in those areas where you're doing research on your ancestors, start asking the question, where are the records? Because they're not always where you think they should be. An archive may be a building with the library, museum, or another repository. Many of our local public libraries have genealogy rooms in them. They have genealogy sections where there's reference books. Maybe there's some loose papers, uh, special collections there. And so libraries are a type of archive. Um, museums are also a great archive. This is actually a library where I grew up. Uh, they have a whole genealogy room. And believe it or not, when you walk into this library, the genealogy room is kind of in the back, kind of out of sight. And so you never would know it was there. And for some reason, a lot of libraries tend to do that. They kind of put the genealogy section or the genealogy rooms kind of out of sight. So ask about them. Ask what kind of genealogical records they have in their library. So don't discount those public libraries. They could have some great records. Um, one of the things I'd like to say about museums as far as using them for archives, I actually came late to the idea of using museums for genealogy research. Um, but I like to say they have a front room and a back room. The front room has all of the exhibits and displays that they work so hard on to put out there and for us to walk through and look at. 
And then they also have back rooms, just like regular archives. They've got those back rooms that you can't see that are filled with shelves, which are filled with boxes. And those boxes are filled with records. One of, to me, one of the best archives and museums out there is the Williamson County Archives and Museum in Williamson County, Tennessee. If you are ever in the middle Tennessee area, head down to Franklin, Tennessee and visit this archive and museum. And you're going to see why. This is just a couple of photographs of their exhibits. Isn't those fantastic? I mean, that right there alone is a reason to come and visit this particular archive and museum. But as you can see, they have photographs on the walls. They have artifacts that are out. Um, but I'm guaranteeing you, and I know this for a fact, there are records in a back room that you can do research in. This is exactly what it would look like. Uh, just like any other archive, they have what are called the stacks, and they are just shelves, and they have all of these records on them. When you go to a museum and you see an old Civil War letter on display, you should think to yourself, well, you know, if they have one, I bet you that they have more. If you see a photograph on display, uh, I guarantee you they're going to have more photographs in boxes in storage. And so talk to the museum curator about researching on those records. Not all museums allow people to do research in their collections that are in storage. But if you don't ask, you'll never know. And so talk to these museum curators about your family, about your research. Show them that you're really serious about your research. And just maybe you will gain access to those records. So the first thing we need to understand about loose records is that they are totally and separately different from the bound volumes of records that we normally work with. This is a typical bound volume that when we're at an archive and the archivist or the librarian um, or even the museum curator brings us a record book, this is kind of what they look like. A lot of them are leather, uh, they're well worn. This is actually a circuit court bound volume from 1871 to 1875 that we have here in the archives. And so these bound volumes that have information in them, we're pretty familiar with these. They are, um, they have contained records and information that are in these large and actually quite heavy bound volumes. And so we as genealogists for decades have known about these. We've been doing research in them for years. And so this is something that we know about. These bound volumes uh, have, for the most part, been one of the first things to be microfilmed, which is fantastic. They've also been one of the first things to be digitized. Um, and so it's important that we understand that we can probably access a lot of these vet bound volumes of records online uh, or on microfilm at a facility. Or maybe we can even talk to the local archive that has them and maybe they've done an in-house digitization project and we can access them that way. One of the things that genealogists need to understand about bound volumes of records is that those bound volumes may not contain all the information for a particular event. So let's say, for instance, you have found a court case for one of your ancestors in a bound volume minute book, a court minute book. And in that court minute book, they have some information in there about the case. Well, that may not be all the information available. That's why it's important that we understand what loose records are and how to find them. So when you're doing research, if you find something in a bound volume, don't stop there. Start looking for and asking for loose records associated with those volumes. And I guarantee you that if they exist, you're going to find a lot more information than what is in the bound volumes. Here is an example. This is that bound volume book that I just showed you the front cover of. As we were processing our bound volume books, we go through them. Uh, if, I don't know about you, but if you've noticed your ancestors, when you have books, um, you, if you go through them, people like to stick things in books for placeholders or they just got stuck in there. And so as we were going through the books, we came across this folded piece of paper and I thought, okay, well, it's something that was just stuck in there. So I opened it up. And this is what it was. It was dated April the 2nd, 1873. It was written in pencil. It was in, it was very dark, very good quality, maybe because it has been folded up and in that book since 1873. Um, we found it in uh, 2012. Uh, but this is a letter from Jack, uh, John Henson. His name was Jack Henson. 
dated April the 2nd, 1873. Now his spelling is absolutely atrocious. But when you read this, he's actually have sent a little note to the courts asking them to send out subpoenas for certain people uh, to be brought up on charges. So when you read, when I saw this, I immediately knew who John Henson was. Uh, you'd have to live in Middle Tennessee to understand the importance of this John Henson known as Jack Henson. This is him. He was an infamous Civil War sniper. Uh, the story was is that the Union killed both of his sons and he went on a revenge rampage after that. Uh, his gun, which he had handmade, is still in private hands today. Uh, you can't, you know, it's been out, it's been on display. Uh, there's been books written about Mr. Henson. And we found a document that he actually wrote in our records, and it is considered a loose paper. Uh, and so these kinds of records are fantastic. So let's talk about some loose records and what are they? Loose records are, re are records and information not found in the bound volumes. We already covered that part. Um, very few loose records have been microfilmed, digitized, and have been put online. Now, that's changing on a daily basis. So don't get discouraged. There are databases out there that are offering these uh, loose records in a digitized form. There are organizations that are going to these archives and actually have projects where they are digitizing these loose records and getting them online. And so I'm hoping that they continue that and we get more and more online. But for the most part, these records are going to have to be found at an archive. Uh, these records may be found trifolded and tucked into sleeves or packets. They may be even called packets. Uh, ones that I'm thinking about are like probate packets. You may have heard of that. In an archive setting, one of the things that we do is that we take these records uh, out of their sleeves or their packets, we flatten them, we clean them, and we put them in file folders and put those file folders in boxes, and then we catalog or index them. Uh, many times, flattening records, that's what we want to do is get everything as flat as possible because the folding and unfolding of records really um, breaks down the fibers in the paper on those folds. And there'll come a day where it will just literally fall apart. I've had documents fall apart in my hands because they were folded and unfolded so many times. But loose records are a true gold mine for genealogists. If you're not researching in the records I'm going to show you today, I suggest you put them on your to-do list. And any repository, archive, museum, library that you work with when you're researching your ancestors, ask them about these records. So some uh, collections that are considered loose records are these. Vertical files, which we're going to go into more detail here in just a minute about each one of these. So vertical files are considered a loose record. Manuscript collections um, are considered a loose record. There could be loose marriage records. Now, all of us have probably done research in the bound marriage volumes records, but there could be other documentation associated with the marriage that is in a loose state and is archived separately from the bound volumes. Probate records. These are probably the most well-known of loose records. So you might have seen probate packets, probate files, uh, and a lot. there's been a few of these now that have been digitized and put online but probates are uh, one of those loose record collections. And court records, just regular court records. These are fantastic to read through, whether they're a criminal court case or a civil court case, a good juicy divorce is always a good one to, to read through. And so these loose records, again, remember, these are separate individual loose documents that have not the same information in a bound volume, they have additional information that is not found in the bound of volumes. So let's talk about vertical files. Vertical files are something that I discovered way back in 2010. Um, I was actually doing some research in a university uh, in Kentucky. And when I was there, I got finished with my work and I looked around the room and there were filing cabinets around the perimeter of the room. There were no labels on them. And so being the nosy genealogist that I am, I went up to one of the filing cabinets, opened the drawer, 
and there were file folders in there and in each file folder there was something different there were newspaper clippings there were business records there were genealogies in there and all these file folders had surnames on them or subject names on them and so i asked the clerk about it and she introduced me to vertical files uh, and so today i absolutely love them they are truly a hodgepodge of loose documents filed by surname or subject name, and they are in most archives. Now, you won't probably see them. They're not going to be out in the research area where you're usually sitting to do your research. They're going to be behind closed doors. You'll need to ask for an index. Either that index will be in a paper form. Uh, maybe it might be on the in-house computer that you can access. Um, they may even have their index on their web page, the archives web page. So looking at the index, you can look for your surname, you can look for subject things like schools or churches, and there may be files for that. Here's an example of a couple of the vertical files that we have in the Houston County, Tennessee archives. As you can see, there are surnames, there are company business names. And so each one of these file folders has a document in it. It may have a few documents in it. It may have a lot of documents in it. Uh, the reason that archivists have put together vertical files is because there's not enough on that particular subject or that particular surname to create an entire collection that we call the manuscript collection. So that goes into the vertical files. Uh, again, these are normally found in filing cabinets, um, in uh, the back rooms or the storage areas of archives. These are what we have. We've actually moved into a fourth cabinet because the vertical files are ever growing. As people donate a news clip, newspaper clipping here or a family group sheet here or a business letterhead from this business, it goes into the vertical files. And so it will grow over time. It's always being added to. Vertical files could contain just about anything. I like to say they're like a box of chocolates. You just never know what you're going to get. So when you request a particular file for a surname or a subject name and you get the file, when you go to open that file and look in there, you just don't know what you're going to get. But hopefully you'll find something that you can use for your research. So what can be found in vertical files? Well, I've already said literally anything, but newspaper clippings many archives actually that's all their vertical files are are newspaper clippings so why would that be significant when we have the newspapers on microfilm and a lot of them are even digitized now well have you ever been looking for a particular issue of a newspaper and you're on that microfilm and you're scrolling and you're almost getting to that particular date and when you get there you find that it's not there it's missing uh, this is where vertical files can come into play. Maybe someone clips stuff out of that particular issue you're looking for, and those clippings are located in a vertical file. That's why I also love to look at scrapbooks, scrapbooks that have newspaper clippings in them for those newspapers that were just not saved or microfilmed. Great place to find them. Here's some examples of some newspaper clippings in our vertical files. As you can see, there's a golden wedding announcement. There is an obituary. And look there, there is a little advertisement for Emma Sykes for her cleaning and pressing and sewing business. Now, I can tell you, I have blown that little advertisement up because it really is only the size of about one inch by one inch. Uh, it was very small in the newspaper, but I blew it up for this presentation. So newspaper clippings is a treasure trove and something that you can find in vertical files. Also, what you can find in vertical files are family group sheets and some brief family histories. Now, a lot of the family histories that are published that are in a book form should be on shelves. But a lot of times we get people who bring in a brief family history and they usually go into the vertical files. Now, I encourage genealogists to do a family group sheet, to type up a brief family history, donate it to the archive where your family is from. Uh, and then they will have it in their vertical files. Make sure you include your contact information. So when researchers come along behind you, find this information, they can then contact you and you can make a connection and hopefully share information that will help both of you. And so finding these family group sheets and family histories, remember, they are done by humans. They are probably going to have mistakes in them. Not everything's going to be correct. 
but it's something that we can use as a guide. Here, hmm. there it is. This is a family group sheet for Edmund Herschel Cook. Uh, it is in our vertical files under Cook. There is a file for the Cook surname and this is in that file. Uh, here's a pedigree chart for the same family. Uh, when it was donated, we got the family group sheet and the pedigree chart. So these are in our vertical file. So if you're researching this family, what a wonderful piece of information that you can find in an archive in the vertical files. Business letterheads, invoices, and receipts. If your ancestors own businesses in the local area, or, you know, maybe they you have information that says they shopped at a particular store and you just want to know what anything about that particular store, you can find these in the vertical files. Uh, the one there on the, the left is from 1915, the B.W. Hussey. Uh, it's a mercantile store, hardware, queensware. And the other one on the right is a bank. Uh, maybe you're trying to find the bank that your ancestor actually banked at. Uh, so look for this information, these documents in vertical files. You can also sometimes find photographs in vertical files. Now, not every time. I know there, there's, there's not really a standard. A lot of archivists will put photographs in their vertical files, but I've also seen some archives where they have taken and collected all of the photographs they have and put them in a photograph collection to itself. So you may be able to find photographs and vertical files. And the images are just a couple. We have decided to put all of our photographs in a photograph collection that is divided up by surname, subject name. Uh, and so it's available that way. They're indexed, they're cataloged, but you may find photographs in vertical files. Vertical files contain documents and ephemera that are usually donated. Um, and so that's why it's very important that we look in vertical files because people will clean out their attics, they'll clean out a dresser drawer after someone passes away, they'll clean out a basement or something, and they don't know what to do with these things. So gratefully, they have donated them to an archive, and that's where a lot of these things go is into a vertical file. These particular documents were donated to our archives from our local Historical Society president. Um, these are applications for membership into the Sparkman Burial Association from 1933. These two documents for our area are extremely important to us. The reason being is because um, the funeral home that was here uh, way back into the 1800s up to about 1977 uh, had a tremendous amount of records. When Mr. Wiseman, who owned the funeral home, passed away, um, his wife instructed their daughter that upon her death, that she was the daughter was to destroy all of the funeral home records because she felt like they were not to be seen by anybody, and so she wanted them destroyed. Well, when her uh, when she died, her daughter did exactly what she was told. She destroyed all of the funeral home records. So when we have something like this that comes to light, we are very excited to be able to have this documentation. This is another fun one that we have in our vertical files. This is actually um, an elementary school license for Miss Gertha Brooks. Miss Gertha Brooks was a school teacher for decades here in our area, and this is her certificate. What I like about this is underneath her name, it says something pretty interesting. Of course, this is from 1919, and it says, uh, Gertha Brooks is a person of good moral character who does not use intoxicants, opiates or cigarettes and having passed the examination required by law is entitled to uh, teach in the elementary schools. So and on the back of the certificate were all of her actual grades as well. So we have this in our vertical files. So I hope I've gotten you very excited about vertical files. Put it on your to-do list. Any archive you contact, ask them if they have vertical files. So the next collection I want to talk about are manuscript collections. Now in Canada, um, some European countries and other places outside of the United States, this particular collection of records might be called FONDS collections, F-O-N-D-S. And so when you're looking for these collections, look for them under manuscript collections. They can also be called special collections, uh, but you may find them as FONDS if you live in a country outside of the United States. But mainstream collections I'm extremely passionate about 
Um, I think that they are the most underused records collections in the genealogy world. Um, I think it's because they are misunderstood or they're not understood at all. I don't think that a lot of genealogists even know they exist. Um, they are a little bit different to do research in and that you need to use um, the finding aid, which is a document that is produced for the collection. Uh, not a lot of them are online. Uh, and they're just not historically one of those collections that many genealogists use for their research. But it should be something that should be at the top of the list because they have fantastic records. This is an example of a manuscript collection. Um, I'm asked all the time, what is a manuscript collection? Well, this is how I describe it in layman's terms. So think about all the genealogical records you have in your home, in your possession. Uh, think about the photographs, the documents, scrapbooks, the family Bible, grandma's quilt, uh, maybe the christening gown, your mother's wedding dress, you know, on and on. So take all of those materials, the documents, the photographs, the artifacts, the family heirlooms, put them all in boxes, take those boxes down to your car, get in your car and drive to the first archives you come to and hand it all over and donate it. That is a manuscript collection. So you can understand that literally anything can be found in manuscript collections. So this photograph here I like to use because it can really get people to understand what I'm talking about. Back in 2014, Miss Nina Finley, who was our county historian, suddenly passed away. Um, we truly miss her because her knowledge, she was, she was one of those people you could mention a surname to, and three hours later, she's still telling you about that family. And so we really, really miss her. So a few weeks after her death, her son calls me and asks me if we would like to have all of her historical and genealogical records that were in her attic. Uh, we were very excited. We said, yes, we would love to have them. We will make it a Nina Finley manuscript collection. And so two truckloads later, this is what we received. Uh, this is just actually a, a partial photograph of what we received. I did not know it was going to be two truckloads worth. But we have reboxed everything and we have archived everything. And it is available to researchers. So see, whatever is in someone's attic, whatever is in someone's basement, their closet, in an old abandoned building, are records that we can be using for our genealogy research. That's why our research is never done, because there's still stuff stored in buildings and in homes that may just one day be donated. Um, Mansion collections are a collection of records housed in file folders and boxes. That's how they are housed. Here is a completed manuscript collection. Um, Houston County, Tennessee, we have an Irish celebration every year. It started in 1963. It's the third Saturday of every March. And we have a parade and we have celebrations. The reason why we have an Irish celebration is because of the Irish railroad workers that built the railroad through here in the 1850s. Uh, and so we celebrate the Irish heritage. And this particular collection is a an accumulation of programs, photographs, newspaper articles, everything that has been collected since 1963 about this celebration. And we've turned it into a manuscript collection for anyone who would like to research the history of this celebration. They can come and they can research in these boxes. So this is kind of what one looks like. Manuscript collections could be one box of records or it could be 200, 300 boxes of records. It all depends on how much is contained in the collections. Again, mainstream collections for the most part are donated by individuals, businesses, and private organizations. And so you could have an individual that's uh, donated a collection of family records. You could have a business that has donated all their business records. You could have a local civic group that maybe has donated their records. So that's a great place to find genealogy information. This particular story always makes me sad when I tell it, but it makes me happy at the same time. Uh, about four years ago, I had a couple of sisters walk into our archives. They were carrying two boxes. This is just a photo of one of them. They were carrying two boxes filled with these binders. And they told me that their mother was in the nursing home and they were in the process of cleaning out her home. 
And they came across these boxes and they were on their way to throw everything away, including these boxes, when someone told them that I might be interested to, at them here in the archives. So I started looking at what they had in the boxes and I realized, I could not believe it, I realized that these binders um, were an accumulation of about 50 years worth of genealogy research that their mother had done. And they didn't have any interest in it. They were on their way to throw it away. And I, yes, I took the boxes because I thought these are on their way to go to the garbage and I can't let that happen. So that's why it's important that you find a home for your genealogical research now. Go ahead and plan now because you don't want your children or your grandchildren to just see it and think it's just garbage and throw it away. Um, and so that's why when they walked into my archives, I could not let them walk back out with them. The most important part of the manuscript collection is the finding aid. The finding aid is a document that's produced by the archivist um, while they are processing the collection. This document is a sort of roadmap to a particular collection. It includes all kinds of wonderful information about the collection, um, including the contents list. The contents listing will tell you a box by box, folder by folder description of what's in the collection. So that will help you to understand what's in the collection. Is it something that will be of help to me? So reading the finding aid is imperative. Uh, here's a, just a brief example of a find, part of a finding aid. This is the Marie Stalker Estate Collection at the Houston County, Tennessee Archives. And a brief listing of the contents. Uh, now, folder number seven has correspondence. There's a letter to parents from Talmadge dated May 25th, 1925. Now, in my case here in the archives where I work, I have the luxury of being a smaller archive and I can take the time to list everything in a manuscript collection if I feel like I want to. Most archives, what you're going to find is you're going to find the line that says folder seven correspondence 1925 and that's it. They're not going to list every document underneath that folder. So you're going to have to decide, is this something that might can help me? Is there could be there be something in there about my ancestors and then request those particular folders or collection to be pulled for you. Very few manuscript collections or fonds collections are microfilmed, digitized or online. But again, more and more records are coming online. I'm seeing a few more manuscript collections coming online here and there. But the finding aids, just like the vertical files index, there's usually a finding aid index either at the archives in a paper form, uh, on their in-house computer, or maybe they've put their finding aid index on their website. So look for that finding aid index. Uh, if you see something of interest, contact the archivist and walk through them about what maybe would be of interest to you. Here's an example of a manuscript collection that um, has something very interesting in it that is even just as an archivist, as a genealogist, I would never have known except for the fact a family member knew exactly what it was. We have a collection of records called the Bateman Family Records Collection. Uh, we have a local family here that have been here since the founding of our county with the last name of Bateman. Um, they, in fact, uh, George Houston Bateman was the local county historian for many years. And in his home were records and they looked just like this. They were in really bad shape. And in fact, we, they got some of the records out, but then his house burned. So a lot of things were actually lost. So when we received these records, they were in very, very poor shape. And so we worked on these records, got them um, clean, got them flattened, got them cataloged and ready for the collection. But there was something in here that honestly, um, we, archivists never throw anything away, but I actually considered throwing it away because it just looked like a piece of trash. This is actually an envelope uh, from the Nashville Pure Milk Company from 1931. Uh, Mrs. Bateman, uh, Grandma Myrtle Bateman, as they called her, um, actually had owned the farm here. Uh, her grandson actually still owns the farm today. And she used to sell her milk to the Nashville Pure Milk Company. And so she would have correspondence. They would pay her and things like that. Well, this was an envelope that had her name on it. There was nothing in the envelope. Um, there was some uh, adding and subtracting kind of written on the envelope, kind of, you know, scratches on there. Um, and it actually had been at somehow attached with some kind of glue substance to another 
piece of a document. And so we were really considering just throwing it away because we could not get them separated. And as you can see, there is, it's not a very good scan, but it, there's an actual an amount there. There is uh, adding, subtracting, and there's actual an amount. Well, I reached out to Myrtle Bateman's grandson, who's actually our county historian today. And I asked him, I said, do you think this is anything significant that we should keep? And when he saw this, his face lit up. He knew that amount, $3,250.21. It was significant to him. What it was, is this was during the Depression, 1931 in the United States. She was figuring up on this envelope how much she could pay for the neighboring farm that they were auctioning off. The reason that, his, that the, her grandson that I talked to knew of this is because he had all the paperwork, he had the deeds, he had the auction paperwork showing this amount that she paid for the neighboring farm. And so he told me later that this document meant the world to him. And so we still have it in the collection and we have a wonderful story to go with it. So another type of loose record that you should be looking for are loose marriage records. Now we all work with the loose or the bound marriage records. Many, many, and many of them are digitized and can be found online. Um, but the loose marriage records are additional paperwork relating to the marriage event that are filed in file folders and in boxes that are not with the bound volumes. And it may be something you may have to ask for. If you find a marriage record in a particular area uh, in the bound volumes, just ask, do you have any additional extra paperwork like loose papers, um, packets or anything like that associated with this marriage? Of course, they're archived separately from the bound uh, marriage volumes. What could be found in these loose marriage records? It could include affidavits, I have seen parent permission letters giving permission for an underage child to get married. Uh, there could be marriage bonds, paperwork in these uh, loose records. And we don't have to do this now, but used to when we have to get had to get a blood test before we got married, blood test results are in these records. Many of these, I have seen very, very few loose marriage records, microfilm digitized or online. I don't know why there's no, doesn't seem to be an importance to get these online, maybe because the, they think, you know, that the bound volumes are enough, but these can have some fantastic records in them. Here's an example of a marriage blood test. I have redacted the names because in the state of Tennessee, um, it is against the law for us to share medical information from an archives. And so I've redacted those names, but I can share the document with those redacted names. Here's another example of what can be found in loose marriage records. This is actually another copy of the marriage license. For some reason, our county court clerk would give the bride and groom a marriage license, but he would also fill out one and put it in a file, an extra one. And so it was great to find these marriage licenses. Next is probate records. I think these are probably the records that many genealogists are probably more familiar with when it comes to loose records. Um, they are one of my favorite types of records to do research in. Again, these are additional paperwork that's related to the probate of the deceased. Um, this will include more than a will and testament. It'll include a lot more. Uh, this is an example of a probate file. This is for William Pooley from 1959. Um, and as you can see, there's literally everything in here. There are tax receipts, there's newspaper clippings, there's um, uh, court documents, uh, everything and everything having to do with his probate process is in here. Now, all of the, none of this is in the bound volumes. When you're looking at bound probate volumes, bound will books, bound administrator uh, records, things like that, this stuff is not in there. And so that's why it's important we look for these records because it's additional information to help us tell us more of the story of his probate. Uh, this particular story is a personal one. This is actually um, from my own research. Uh, Jesse Glasgow is my husband's third great grandfather. And something interesting happened to me as I was going to school to become an archivist, which was in 2010 through 2013 for three years. I was in class one day 
And one of the other students, actually a lady who was becoming an archivist in a neighboring county, raised her hand and asked a question. She said, we have these records that were found in a box. They don't belong to anything else in the box. Um, we don't know what to do with them. We don't know how to archive them. And about that time, she drops the name Jesse Glasgow. And I just about fell out of my chair. I couldn't say anything in the middle of class. But after class, I asked her, I said, what do you have? Um, and she, she had this envelope, which this is a scan of the envelope, pretty dilapidated. Inside this envelope was around uh, 60 to 70 individual original documents. Uh, and as you can see, the wording on here just says deeds. And then it says died March 1892. And Jessica Glasgow did die in March of 1892. But these are loose records. And um, what we found in this dilapidated old envelope was amazing. Uh, again, probate records are going to be archived separately from the will books and other probate records. So here's some examples of what were found in Jesse Glasgow's, that envelope that I got. Uh, this is an invoice from September the 29th, 1886. Uh, this is E.E. E. Collison. He was a very well-known photographer in the area at the time. Um, one thing that caught my eye was that Jesse Glasgow purchased a photograph. You can see that there I've uh, pointed out with that red arrow. I do not have a photograph of Jesse Glasgow. Now, is it a photograph of him? Is it a photograph of one of other family members that he paid for? We don't know. I am on the lookout for this particular photograph. Probate records can contain affidavits, correspondence, invoices, receipts, um, statements from family members, lists of family members who stand to gain from the um, inheritance. Those could be in there. Uh, these were in Jesse Glasgow's probate loose records. Again, more receipts, but they tell a story. The one on the left of his is a receipt for Jesse Glasgow himself, dated September 14th, 1887. Um, it's at the Thomas and Bradford's Mer General Merchandise Store. He purchased nails and, you know, things like that. He purchased bacon and a pair of shoes. But the one on the right was very interesting to me. It's for Notley Harris, dated the same day. Notley Harris is Jesse Glasgow's son-in-law. Notley Harris was married to Jesse's daughter, Mary Glasgow. If you look at what his receipt says, it will make you think. He purchased three coffins, one for $12, one for $8, and another one for $8. And if you look at the dates, they match, almost, match up almost exactly to the dates when his wife died and his two children died. So this was a significant find for my research into this family. Again, many of these are not microfilm digitized or online, but again, uh, for some reason, the people who are digitizing these records have honed in on probate records and they're getting more and more of them online, which I am very, very excited about. Here's another document out of the Jessica Glasgow probate uh, loose papers. Uh, this one sent me down a rabbit hole. Um, it is a, a uh, actually a Louisiana state lottery ticket from June the 9th, 1888. Now, if you want to go down a rabbit hole, just Google Louisiana state lottery 1888. You will find that two Civil War generals, General Beauregard and General Early, were in charge of this lottery. And it was a mess. Uh, it was um, a lot of illegal things were going on. And so there's a whole story to this. So I got to looking at this uh, this ticket, actually, and I thought, well, when did Jesse Glasgow go to Louisiana to purchase a lottery ticket? He had lived in Tennessee his entire life. I've documented his entire life. You know, granted, you know, anyone can go anywhere at any time. But then as I was looking in the newspapers, I found an advertisement for the Louisiana State Lottery in a local Tennessee newspaper that he probably would have seen. And it told me in that advertisement that you could go to your local post office and purchase a ticket. Um, and then they would actually print the ticket numbers, the winning ticket numbers in the newspapers as well. And at the bottom of this document, you'll see his lottery number. So I've been searching to see if he actually won the lottery so far. I've not been able to find his lottery number in the newspaper as a winner. So a very interesting document and one that I have not found in any other bound volume. It is a loose paper and one that I would say is pretty rare find that has survived. 
So loose court records. Now we talked about probate records. That's a type of court record, but also criminal court, civil court has loose court record packets. Here's an example of that. This is one for William uh, Hudson, and it is for uh, he was being brought up of charges of going armed. When I processed this record, now, I mean, I processed it myself. I had taken all of the documents out of the little packet there. They had been trifolded. I had flattened them, gotten them ready. But I noticed there was something else in the packet. And so I went looking to see what was in there. And it was actual knife itself. It was the straight blade razor that he had gone armed with and had threatened someone with. And so we actually still have it in the collection. It is extremely sharp. This is from 1953, and it's still very, very sharp. And so these are the kinds of records you can find that is in addition to what can be told to you in those bound volumes. Again, these court records, these loose ones are going to be separate from the bound record volumes. So if you find a court case in the bound volumes, Talk to the archivist about if they have any loose papers, loose packets, things like that. Uh, here's just an example of some loose papers that were actually found stuck into the court minute books. Um, and so a lot of times we will leave those in there if they have to do with that particular case. Uh, these right here had nothing to do with whatever was in that book. And so we have filed them accordingly. But loose papers can be found anywhere. Our loose papers of any kind, no matter what kind of collection you're talking about, are going to have additional information not found in those bound volumes. And if you're like me, I want to tell the whole story. And so the bound volumes are great. I get the information out of there, but then I always look for these loose records to tell me the rest of the story. Um, this was actually in a court file. Uh, it's actually an exhibit. Um, and it's a hand-drawn map of the downtown area of where we live from 1946. It's fantastic. It shows us the public square, shows us the stores or who was there. Um, it's helped us to document our local history. The loose papers, no matter what kind of collection you find them with, are considered working papers. Um, in, a court case, in the court records case, they could have affidavits, subpoenas, um, witness statements, even photographic evidence if they were taking photographs of a a scene, um, a, a crime scene, or even uh, if there was a car wreck, maybe that scene, photographs of things that happened, whatever the, if it was a criminal case or a civil case, we have found photographic evidence in these loose court records. This one was pretty interesting. This was found in a court record. They were going to court. It was a civil case about the boundary lines of a particular local cemetery. And inside of the court case were the listings of who was buried in that cemetery. Uh, this is just one page, there were several pages. And so what a great find for us as an archives, but what if you had found this for your family member? This helps us to help document even fully this McIntosh Cemetery. And so we were, it was a great find for us. These court records, uh, again, uh, many of them are starting to come online. Uh, I'm seeing that a lot of our archives are getting the probate records digitized. The court records are getting more digitized, but you may still find that you need to contact the archive to get into those records. So I've told you about some different loose records. I hope that you start looking for them and asking archivists about them. But where do we find these loose records? Uh, loose records are almost always stored in back rooms behind closed doors and what we call the stacks. And the stacks is just, you know, shelving units with boxes on them. Uh, this is not something you're going to be able to access yourself for the most part. You're going to have to ask the archivist about them. Look for an index, a cataloging of them. Uh, maybe it's on their website. But um, it's something you're going to have to do some legwork to get uh, contact with. This is actually a photograph of a local county archive in the next county over from me. Uh, this is when I was on a visit to visit their archive. I like to share this photograph because it is a great example of what I always tell people that not everything is online. Um, everything that you see on these shelves, except for the books at the very back, none of what you see on these shelves is online anywhere. Uh, and so that's why I tell genealogists, you've got to start working with these archives, start looking at these records that are in the facilities. 
There's nothing wrong about researching online. I do it all the time as well. And like I said, there are more records coming on every day, but you're still going to have to go to these archives and look at these records that are in boxes. Talk to the archivist, the clerk, the librarian, the museum curator. Ask him about loose records. Ask him if they have them. Uh, you'll be very surprised when you find out they probably do. Um, create a relationship with these people, especially if you have ancestors in a particular area that have lived there for a long time. That means that you're going to be working with that particular archive over and over. So it's great to start a relationship with them. <coughs> This is a great example of a manuscript collection. This is the Lyle Family Records collection that was donated to our archives. As you can see, it contains all kinds of different things. It contains a ledger book, it contains a scrapbook, newspaper clippings, photographs. So look for these kinds of things in local archives. <coughs> Again, check online websites for archives. They may have a listing or an index or a catalog of their loose records. Uh, this is from the Tennessee State Library and Archives, Archives Development. <coughs> Excuse me. And in their um, physical holdings listing, it says probate court loose papers. So they are slowly coming online and banging in their indexes. So start looking for that. Here's another example of that from Robertson County, Tennessee. These are the loose records project from their chancery court. Uh, and as you can see, they have it listed and they are microfilmed. And so it's a great thing to find. Always contact or visit the archive. Sometimes the only way to know what they have is to communicate with them, to visit with them. Uh, and these days and times that we're living in now, we may have to email or phone call, uh, but work with them, talk to them about the collections that they have. Uh, this is a great story. This is actually an old photograph of the Tennessee State Library and Archives from about 1953. This was just soon after the building was built. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is actually where I went back to school to become an archivist. And one day, one of the last few days of class, they asked us if we would like to have a tour of the Tennessee Supreme Court records. Now, we got a chance to work on those records during class, cleaning them, um, archiving them, flattening them, putting them in folders ready for researchers. So, yes, we would love to see those records. They put us on the elevator. We went to the top floor of this building where I'm pointing to. And when we got off the elevator, as far as we could see, were nothing but shelves and boxes filled with Tennessee Supreme Court records. This particular project is going to be a multi, multi-year project. They will be working on it forever, trying to get these ready for researchers. Um, on their website, they, they um, add to their index of their Tennessee Supreme Court records as they process the records, so you can order these records. Um, but fantastic records, and they are just in archives. Every archives has them. Uh, this is when I was at the Archives Institute, where I'm pointing to. Those are my hands working on the Tennessee Supreme Court records. And these are all loose records you see on this table. Uh, they look just like this. If any of you have ever seen these kinds of records, you know what I'm talking about. They contain some of the most fantastic information. Um, I could just sit and read them all day. I would never get anything done in the archives if I sat down and read these records. And so as a genealogist, when I can find loose records for my ancestor, I get very excited. So loose records are a goldmine for genealogists. Um, they can fill in those gaps of missing information. And they can tear down maybe a brick wall. I mean, I don't like to call them brick walls because I think one day um, I'm going to find all the information. But we all have these points in our research where we can't get past a certain place or we can't find a certain piece of information. And maybe in the loose records, you'll find those. So put these loose records on your to-do list so the next time you do research, you'll be looking for them. Thank you so much for attending this presentation. Uh, please visit my blog, A Genealogist in the Archives. And also you can find me on Facebook. Uh, I'm under The Archive Lady. Just search it. You'll find me. And if you have any questions about this presentation or researching in archives or records preservation, please drop me an email, melissabarker20 at hotmail.com. I love getting email from those that watch my presentations. And with that, Esther, I will turn it back over to you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, Melissa. That was so informative. And I loved seeing all those different 
um, stories, especially that knife. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Incredible. Um, so we do have a, a few questions. Before I get to them, I just wanted to read out a couple uh, comments we received throughout the presentation. Um, let's see what we have here. Melody said, uh, vertical files are the first place I go to now when I go to the archives. Um, it's wonderful. I'm glad to hear yeah. that. Uh, Dina wrote, wow, the photographs in the vertical files is a great idea. <laughs> Let's see, uh, we have Becky. Becky wrote, be sure to check your death records for autopsies. Yes, yes. And then she said, then find where they are stored in your area. They are chocked full of information. Yes, and also look for, and I used to call it, I don't know if they still call it now, but they used to call it coroner's inquests, which was kind of what they called them before. They called them autopsies. And, um, and so I actually got one of those for my great, great, my great grandmother. Um, sorry to say she was hit by a train uh, and killed. But when I was reading through there, I, I had laughed out loud, believe it or not, reading through there, I laughed out loud because a gentleman who was a witness gave his testimony. And his testimony was that she had was carrying groceries and she was trying to beat the train and she didn't make it. And when the train hit her, he got pelted with wet stuff. He thought it was her. Ended up being she had eggs in her bag and they were eggs. <laughs> I laughed out loud when I read that, but I know it's not something to laugh at, but I did. I laughed. Wow. What a, what a nice uh, anecdote there <laughs> <laughs> to learn, to learn about, uh, about your ancestor. Let's see. We also have um, Mary wrote and she said, thanks for suggesting to not throw away seven boxes of my notes from researching my parents' genealogy, along with four huge notebooks, including hundreds of family photos. Now, to decide where to take them is my next decision. So do you have any, any suggestions of, of where to take them, what to do with them? Well, I would suggest to Mary that wherever your ancestors lived, I would contact the archives in that area and talk to them before you just show up with your boxes, because a lot of our archives are running out of room. And so a lot of archives are very particular about what they'll take. Uh, and so if you can't find something in the local area, then I suggest you would go to the state archives. If you live in the United States, all 50 U.S. states have a state archives. If you live in another country, they do have other archives that are not the local archives, but they're one or two steps up from the local archives, maybe um, something at the um, um, what I would call a state level. But um, just find a historical society, a genealogical society, something in the someplace in the area that you know it'll be safe and you know that it'll be um, available to the public because you don't want someone just to put it in a box and put it in an old storeroom. You want it to be available to researchers. Definitely. Uh, we have another question here from Janice and she asks, I have so many old family letters and documents. I've put them in protective sleeves and into a binder, but I wonder if that is the best preservation method. And do I even save the photocopies of these documents? I've scanned most originals into my computer, but suggestions. <laughs> um, I would not keep the copies. If you have original letters, keep the originals. If you have extra copies, you don't need to keep the copies. Um, now, if they're copies of letters and that's all you have, then keep those copies because you never know. Maybe the originals get destroyed and you have the only copy left. Um, putting them in sleeves and in binders is great. The only thing I would tell you is, is a lot of people don't know this, is that when you're storing your binders on the shelf, store them flat. Don't store them like this. Store them flat. Because if you store them like this and if your binders are not full enough that they're all of your pages are standing straight up, they could sag, which means your documents are sagging and they could cause creases or damage. So um, I just tell people to lay their binders down like this. Oh, interesting. I never thought of that. What a, what a great point. Um, let's see, Valerie asked, um, in reference to the family Bible from the 1870s, how do you store it? It, it is very large and the pages are crumbling. Thank you. <laughs> well, you can go to my blog, a genealogist in the archives, and I write about that. But actually, you know, a many records preservation uh, things that you can do to your documents um, is actually simple. And people think, well, I'm not an archivist. How is it simple? Because less is more. 
the less you do, it's really better. So all you need to archive a family Bible is archival tissue paper and an archival box to fit the Bible. Uh, and you just lightly wrap your Bible in that archival tissue paper, lay it in your box. And the main thing is to store it in a cool, dark, dry place where the temperature and humidity levels are consistent. Uh, the colder, the better. So a dark closet would be good. Um, if, you, if the box, if your Bible's moving around in the box, just take some more of that archival tissue paper, crumple it up and stick it around the Bible, and then it won't move. I see Melody wrote here, I will be changing how my binders are, <laughs> are standing up. Everybody, everybody now is going to their shelves and they're changing their binders. <laughs> new, new lesson for, for a lot of us. Um, let's see. Um, I'll just, we'll just take one last question before we go on to some of these uh, really incredible comments that we received here in the, um, in the comment section. Uh, Linda asks, what year did the blood test start and is it still in effect? <laughs> you know, I honestly don't know. I'm trying to remember. I got married in 1988 and I don't think we had to have a blood test. Um, I know in Tennessee, I don't know about other states or countries, we don't have to do that now. I want to say, I don't know when it was instituted. Um, I want to say probably back, my parents got married in 62. And I think they had to have a blood test probably before then. So I'm not real sure. I'm sure it's something you can Google, and but I think it also depends on where you're at. Okay, we'll just take one last question because I see a, a nice one here again about another one about a family Bible um, yeah. from Jean. And she asks, I have several old family Bibles that are musty. Uh, what can I do to deal with that? So I know you spoke about preserving the Bible just now, but um, but is there anything, I guess, to, to help with that smell? or? Absolutely. You know, and not just for family Bibles, any type of papers or books like scrapbooks or diaries or things that have that musty smell to them. Um, there's a couple things you can do. First, I would, if, it, if you see mold on something, uh, I would take it out and this is going to be contrary to what you hear, but take it out into the sunlight, expose that mold to direct sunlight, not for very long because the sunlight will actually kill the mold spores and it'll stop growing. And then you're going to take whatever it is that has that musty smell and you're going to put it in a plastic container with kitty litter. Oh. Now, don't let the documents or Bible anything touch the kitty litter. Put it in a separate little bowl or something in the container. But that kitty litter will draw out the smell. So you'll need to leave it in there for some time. Check it. You may have to do it. You know, check it. Put it back in there. Check it until the smell is gone. You may not be able to get rid of every bit of the smell, but the kitty litter will draw out a lot of that smell. Wow, I would never have I would never have thought of that. <laughs> Amazing. Um, okay, so we received some really um, incredible comments here. Uh, such nice uh, artifacts or heirlooms um, that everyone in the audience holds close. Uh, just some really fantastic entries uh, that were just so nice to read. Um, I'll just read a couple of the runners up before we announce our winner. That's okay with you, uh, Melissa. Yeah. So let's see. We have um, Pat Vogel, and she said, "My great grandmother's rocking chair that has carved lions' heads at the end of the arms. Uh, it was passed to my grandmother, and then my mother, and now to me. My mother had fond memories of sitting in that chair, running her hands around the lions' mouths, while sitting and waiting for her father to get home from work. Oh, that so sounds beautiful." Yeah, that's so lovely. A piece of furniture to, to still be in such great condition and to be passed on. So nice. Um, and then we have Sarah Louise Bland, and she's another runner up. And she said, uh, my great granddad's, granddad's waterfall painting. He lived mm -hmm. in India and painted different cultures, animals and people. He also served in the army and moved back to England. If he wasn't back in England, I wouldn't exist. So I so love nice. that. I, I have a wonderful painting from my great aunt and it, it's a snow. It's a painting from somewhere in Ohio, but it's a, it has snow and I love snow. And so it's one of my favorite things. Wow. So so what do you do at home to preserve a painting like that? Actually, you know, I, I, the archivist will tell you not to display it because, you know, sunlight could hit it. It can discolor it. It can wash it out. Uh, but I encourage people to enjoy their family heirlooms. 
um, you know, watch how the sunlight hits it. Try not to put, try to put it in a place where the sun won't hit paintings or photographs or documents if you have them framed and on walls. Um, but enjoy them. You know, a lot of times we store them away. And so our children, our grandchildren, our nieces and nephews, you know, that is what we need to do is bring them out, tell them the stories so that they will get interested in the family history and carry on the tradition of keeping those stories alive. So important. That's just such a, such a great message. And, and I love that about, about um, actually appreciating them and while, while preserving them, of course. That's right. <laughs> Incredible. Um, and we'll announce our winner now for My Heritage Complete Plan, the best plan we have to offer at My Heritage. Uh, while we loved all the entries, they were really incredible. And, and I suggest that you all, everyone in the audience, um, go and check them out if you haven't read um, the comments that uh, that everyone gave in of their favorite uh, family artifact or heirloom. Um, that they hold dear to them. Um, and our winner today is Lucille Renfro. And Lucille wrote to us and she said, my most treasured family heirloom is my grandparents who migrated from Northern Italy in the 1860s, ice cream shop, little dishes. My older cousin um, knew them, but um, died before, but they died long before I was born. I so treasure these dishes. Um, two of them, which I have on display in my china cabinet. So that's, that's wonderful. Really, so lovely. Wow, those dishes that um, and and like you said, Melissa, she has them on display. Lucille has them on display where I'm sure her um, her family can can see them and talk about them and really enjoy them. Yes, she does. And so, yeah, that that's fantastic. I think that's great. Congratulations, Lucille, and we'll be in touch with you through private message to claim your prize. Um, and thank you all for joining us, for tuning in to this um, incredible session. Again, if you want to rewatch it, please go back to our Facebook page under the video section and feel free to uh, check it out again, as well as all of our other Facebook Lives. And Melissa, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Esther. And if anyone has any questions, please email me. I would love to hear from you. Great. Have a great day, everyone.